Now you should already know that the derivative of sine x is cos x. But what about the derivative of inverse sine x? What's the answer to that? Now to do that we use a really, really clever fact. And that fact is that the derivative of y with respect to x is equal to 1 over the derivative of x with respect to y. Now geometrically this makes a lot of sense. If this is a function f of x, the derivative tells us the gradient of a tangent at any point. And the gradient of a tangent is like the old rise over run. That's why it's dy dx, the change in y with respect to x. So in this case, if I was to tell you the length of this bit here is 8 and the length of that bit there is 4, rise over run would be 8 over 4, which is 2. And not to put too fine a point on it, but that 2 represents for every 1 that we go across, we go 2 up. The change in y with respect to x. Now, dx dy is the change in x with respect to y, which can be written as run over rise. Now, in this case, what we're saying is it goes 4 across for every 8 up. And to talk about our little 1, for every 1 that it goes up, it goes half across. 1 up, half across. And you can see the relationship between the two here. They're reciprocals. And that's why we can say that dy dx equals 1 over dx dy. Now, all of this work, it really doesn't have a lot to do with inverse trig functions, but it's a fact we need to be able to prove whatever the derivative of that's going to be. All right, so let's get started. We're going to prove, or we're going to find out what the derivative of this is. And this is the formal proof of that. Now, we're going to use this fact. We're going to say, right, well, if y equals the uh, inverse sine x, that means that x equals sine y. All right, so that's easy so far. Now we can say that the derivative of x with respect to y is equal to whatever the derivative of sine y is, which is cos y. Now, we're trying to find the derivative of y with respect to x, right? We're trying to derive this function. So far, we've derived that function and come up with cos y. And we've got this little fact here. If we know dx with respect to y, we can say, therefore, the derivative of y with respect to x is equal to 1 over cos y. Now, so far, so good, but we can't express this as 1 over cos y. We want the de derivative with respect to x, so we need to have like an x in here somehow. Now what I do next is going to seem really like off kilter, but I promise that we're going to bring it back to here in the end. Now we know that sine squared y plus cos squared y is equal to 1, and we can rearrange this whole thing to make it equal to cos y. First step is just subtracting sine squared y from both sides, and then taking the square root of both sides. And now you might be looking at this and going, oh wait a minute. We had a 1 over cos y here. You've just created cos y here. So we could take that and we could shove it into there. And that's great, but it's just a more complicated version. It's still got y in there. We really need it to be in terms of x. Hmm, what can we do? Well, look here. In the beginning of this, we knew that x was equal to sine y. That means that sine squared y must be equal to x squared. So we can shove that into here. And now that we've done that, we can say that therefore the derivative of y with respect to x is equal to 1 over that nonsense. So this is a pretty fantastic result and we can bottle it as a rule and we're going to put that rule right here. And now that we have this proof and now that we know that this identity exists, we can go one step further. And that's to find some sort of derivative rule for something that looks like this. Identical to that, but just with a divide by a. That's useful because often we're putting like pi on 3 and things like that in there. Okay, what can we do here? Well, we've got something that looks identical to that, just with a different thing for our x. So it's a chain, chain rule style question. So we just do what a chain rule would do. So we've got uh, let x over a equal u. So f of x equals this. Now, when I find the derivative, I find the derivative of this, which I get from this formula here, multiply it by the derivative of that, which is just going to be 1 over a. 
Alright, so far so good. Now if I combine those two, I'll get 1 over, I'll put the a down here, root 1 minus u squared. And then I'm going to do something that feels really strange. I'm going to put that a into the root as an a squared. Now it's at this point you should remember, wait a minute, the u isn't u, the u is x over a. So I can sub x over a in there for that u. And we get this beautiful ugly thing. Now, finally, 1 over root. Now look at this. a squared times 1 is a squared. Now this is x, x over a squared, which is x squared over a squared. Now, negative x squared over a squared times a squared would just be negative x squared. And we have this beautiful rule here, which you'll find on a formula sheet somewhere, the derivative of inverse sine x over a is equal to 1 over root a squared minus x squared. Now, I've replaced the previous one with this one. This one's got a bit more utility. It's pretty good. What about cosine? What about tan? Cosine is identical, except you have a negative 1 out the front. If you think back to how I solved, uh, how I proved it in the beginning, you can prove this one in an identical way, and that's how you're going to end up with a negative up the top. Uh, it'll probably have something to do with the derivative of Think about that, sine, cos, cos, sine. Uh, and then we've got 10. A bit lazy there, f dash of x is that. All right, finally we have f of x, inverse 10, x over a. f dash of x will be equal to a over a squared plus x squared. And you can use similar techniques to prove that as to what I used to prove that, but I'm not going to do that in this one. I think one's enough to prove. All right, uh, that's the proof of our derivatives of inverse truth functions.